here. So I think we can begin. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our panelists and participants from across the globe. Welcome to this IPC special session on low fertility trends, policies and politics. My name is Alana Armitage. I am greeting you from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm the regional director for UNFPA's regional office for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And very pleased to be moderating this session, given that the trends, policies, and politics surrounding low fertility are hugely relevant to this region, but also, of course, globally, as we will hear. Um, relevant not only because preparation is needed for the changing demographics that we're seeing, the changing, the demographic shifts that we see across the globe, but also because of some of the human rights implications that um, policies that are being put in place to confront those changes have on uh, women's rights, reproductive rights, et cetera. So we're looking forward to a very um, interesting, perhaps uh, spicy panel today where we get to a lot of different issues related to, to low fertility and aging. We have a stellar panel today with uh, renowned demographers, social scientists from across the world. Peter Francis McDonald from the University of Melbourne and Australia National University, Stuart Geitel Bastian from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Thomas Sabodka from Vienna Institute of Demography and the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Human Global Capital. Um, unfortunately, we just heard from Wanda Caballo that she had a medical emergency and will be unable to join us. Um, but we're very lucky to have Susanna Kavanaugh here with us today, who is the principal organizer of the session, but will also provide us with some reflections from her perspective, including from, from Latin America. So let me begin uh, by introducing you to Dr. Peter Francis McDonald. He is a professor of demography at the University of Melbourne and Professor of Demography Emeritus at the Australian National University. He was the president of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, uh, IUSSP. Sorry, I've just lost my, my notes here. Uh, he was the president of the IUSSP for the years 2010 to 2013 and is currently the honorary president. He has been consulted on the issue of population futures, causes, consequences, and policies by governments around the world. So we are extremely pleased that he will be addressing us today. So let me begin with you, Peter, um, and then I'll get to the rest of you on the panel. Peter, your work on low fertility is primarily in relation to theory. Um, what are the theoretical explanations for low fertility? Please, the floor is yours. Okay. so. Uh... For the past 20 years or so, a large body of research has been focused upon the determinants of low fertility and policy responses to low fertility. And there's been two uh, excellent reviews of this literature, recently published by UNFPA, one by Thomas Sabotka and colleagues, uh, and the other by Elizabeth Wilkins. And the two reports are consistent, really, in providing the following broad consensus. Uh, most people still express desires to have at least two children, but achieve family sizes fall below desires because of social and economic constraints, uh, often, often of an institutional nature. The two main constraints are economic uncertainty uh, and perceived economic costs of children, and gender equity constraints that penalise women more than men uh, if they have children. The main responses have been to provide financial support for families with children and to institute arrangements that make the combination of work and family more feasible. Uh, and interestingly, the new US government uh, is moving strongly in, in that direction. Uh, for the past 20 or 30 years, this framework has been used to explain the observed dichotomy between countries uh, that have had very low fertility rates under 1.5, and those that have had only moderately low fertility rates between 1.5 and 2. <clears throat> the Southern European and German speaking countries uh, had very low fertility, while the Nordic, English speaking, and French and Dutch speaking countries had moderately low fertility. That was a dichotomy. Uh, there are two other, there's two other contexts uh, where very low fertility has been experienced. First, East and Central Europe 
uh, European countries, where fertility had been moderately low, just moderately low to 1990, experienced a rapid fall in to very low fertility rates, most of them after 1990, as prior economic systems came under pressure and previous supports for families with children were uh, uh, diminished. As economic circumstances improved in those countries and as support for families with children increased, fertility rates in East and Central Europe have tended to rise uh, with few exceptions. These trends are consistent with the, with the standard arguments that, uh, or the conventional wisdom that have been made for the Western countries over the past 20 years. The second exception, the second group are the wealthy East Asian countries, including Singapore, uh, that have had the lowest, and they've had the lowest fertility rates ever experienced. And now China has joined them. The gender equity argument for very low fertility is very strong in East Asia. And there are some ar arrangement, uh, arguments around the emergence of short-term working contracts in those countries, uh, particularly in South Korea. But in East Asia, it's also argued that employers demand that workers provide absolute dedication to the company. And the research of Mary Brinton uh, stands out in this regard. Dedication to the company involves long hours of work and workers being available upon the whim of the company. In a sense, the employers see their workers as their family, uh, and family beyond the company gets very short shrift. The attention paid to children is almost seen as disloyalty to the company. And it is instructive that employers in East Asia have fought tooth and nail to block attempts by government to change these conditions. And low fertility is emerging in, in other contexts as well. Uh, we just heard of India's dropping below replacement, Iran, uh, Thailand, Latin America as well. In all these countries, both those with low, moderately low fertility and those with very low fertility, the age of first birth has been increasing continually. And so tempo effects on period fertility cannot be ignored. And nevertheless, it's been shown that countries with very low fertility rates have a low level of recuperation after the delay of the first birth, uh, while those with moderately low fertility have relatively strong levels of recuperation because they have policies or institutions that are supportive of women having children. So that's the standard kind of view uh, up till quite recently. Uh, however, as a challenge to this conventional wisdom, in the past five years, fertility has been rocketing downwards in most of the countries that had sustained moderately low fertility in the past, especially the English-speaking countries and the Nordic countries. Finland is the archetype with fertility falling from 1.8 in 2012 to 1.35 in 2019. And in 2020, the TFR was 1.48 in Norway, 1.66 in Sweden, 1.67 in Denmark. It was 1.47 in Canada, 1.66 in England, 1.54 in Wales, 1.29 in Scotland, 1.61 in Australia, New Zealand and Ireland. Uh, and 1.64 in the US. And there's a big city aspect to this. Uh, in 2020, the fertility rate in Helsinki was 1.16, in Glasgow, 1.04, in Melbourne, uh, where I am now, a multicultural city of 5 million people, uh, the fertility rate in 2020 was below 1.4. So we're getting this very low fertility experience in other contexts now. Uh, what explains this trend? Uh, there's definitely been a renewed surge in the delay of first births, uh, whether it is the uh, early child, whether it's in the early childbearing pattern of the US or the later pattern of most advanced countries. And this implies a strengthening of tempo effects, but as, but as first births occur later and later, the opportunities for recuperation diminish. In the countries with later first births, uh, Age-specific fertility rates are falling at ages 30, 31, 32. Formal, and these were formerly ages of recuperation. Uh, also, most studies indicate that cohort fertility is continuing its long-term downward trend and higher percentage of women will have no children. So what might explain uh, these trends? A potential explanation consists with the conventional wisdom is that each successive generation of women becomes more highly educated, 
more able to compete in the labor market than previous generations. They require increasingly, as that happens, they require increasingly more and more support to achieve their career aims and to have children as well, including support from their partners, their employers and the government. Uh, young women today are more highly educated than young women in all of these countries and labour demand is continually shifting in the direction of jobs in which women are more commonly employed. This means that the opportunity cost for women of having children keeps rising and the need to offset that cost keeps getting more and more intensive. So in Australia in the 12 years to 2021, the percentage of couple families with a child aged less than five in which both partners were employed rose from 48% to 63%, quite a big shift. The change was due almost entirely, to, of course, to more mothers being employed. This shows the ever-growing attachment of young mothers to the labour force. But at the same time, the proportion of young women who were, uh, who were mothers fell. The proportion of women who were not mothers rose. So it might be concluded that while policy help, policies help to support the employment of a higher percentage of young mothers, for other women, these policies were not sufficient to enable them to make the choice to have a child. This interpretation implies the, the operation of constraints consistent with the conventional view. Women wanted to have children, but were constrained from doing so. And the only way we can get them to do so is to give more and more uh, support, that each generation requires more and more support as they come through. Uh, and I think that's, that's one possibility. <clears throat> but there's an alternative explanation. Uh, uh, is it possible that for an increasing proportion of women, having children has lower salience in their lives? Perhaps when young women and young men report in surveys that they would prefer to have two children, many are merely expressing the socially ex acceptable response, the response that is in keeping with the idealized family morality of the society. We know that in Japan, most young people still express a desire to have children, uh, two children, but 30% of women completing the childbearing, who've already completed the childbearing uh, years have not had a baby. Perhaps the practice of having only one child in countries with very low fertility is merely a stepping stone to having none, uh, an attempt to meet social expectations halfway. If having children is now losing its relative value in the life courses of an increasing proportion of young people, do they drift into this situation by delaying the first uh, birth to a point where having the baby is simply too disruptive to establish careers, lifestyles, newly acquired values? Or do more young people have a relatively low value attached to children at an early point in their lives? I think it's probably the former, not the latter even though they may not admit to it in, in quantitative surveys. But uh, surveys suggest that the current generation of, who are now aged about 15 to 24, uh, they don't see a rosy future for the world or for themselves. Uh, and COVID hasn't helped that situation at all. It's made it much worse, in fact. Uh, we need to investigate whether commitment to success in education and, and employment has taken on a relatively stronger value among increasing proportions of young women uh, than having children. In terms of dedication to employment uh, or workism, as it's referred to in the American literature, uh, are the Nordic and English speaking countries becoming more like the wealthy East Asian countries? If so, is this driven by the employees, the employers, or more probably both? Are women becoming much more like men in their dedication to work? Uh, and as argued in the low fertility trap hypothesis, as higher percentages of women have no children, the opportunity cross rise for those who do have them. Uh, if a stronger dedication to employment has emerged, will the experience of work under COVID alter the situation? Uh, I'm talking about the longer term effects of COVID, not the short term disruptive effects. So there are stories of large numbers of workers in the US walking away from their jobs uh, uh, in apparent rejection of workism, the belief that work is the centerpiece of one's identity and life purpose. Many workers, men and women, are also now negotiating, negotiating work from home for two to three days per week, and all my children are doing it. <laughs> uh, and what do uh, men think? Uh, do they matter? Uh, Australian values 
data show that young women have moved much further away from traditional family values than young men. Uh, and young women are much more highly educated than young men. So 100% of countries with fertility below 1.5 want to increase their fertility rate. Uh, now we'll hear from, Tom, uh, from uh, Stuart later on about that, but uh, that's what the 100% of countries at the moment want to increase the fertility rate. How, may, how might they uh, do this? Well, I don't think that's easy to answer, but one thing is clear, whatever policy direction is adopted, it must be consistent with the march forward of gender equity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was uh, absolutely, I would say, fascinating. Thank you for describing, you know, the, the fertility trends, but addressing the challenges on conventional theory. And you gave us really good data on the substantial falls in fertility in the Nordic English speaking countries. Um, I was particularly interested in the, this idea that the opportunity cost for women keeps rising um, and that each generation does need more and more support, both in terms of family policies, which we will be discussing soon, I know, but also in terms of reproductive technologies, IVF. I mean, these are things that we need to discuss. Um, very intrigued by your alternative explanation and the possibility that, that uh, expressed, you know, desired fertility is more a reflection of social norms than actual desires. And um, clearly, I think we need more qualitative data to get to the bottom of all this, but a, a great start to this debate and dialogue. Uh, Thomas Sabotka, let me turn to you. You've done a lot of work on, on this issue. And, and as Peter mentioned, you actually did a study for, for UNFPA on uh, assessing different uh, fertility policies to address low fertility. Uh, Dr. Thomas Sabotka leads the research group Fertility and Family at the Vienna Institute of Demography, the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he also lectures at the Charles University in Prague, and since 2021, he serves as the editor-in-chief of the Vienna Yearbook of Population Research. His research focuses on global low fertility and family changes, family policies, fertility data and measurement, migration, population and family change in Europe, and assisted reproduction. He has helped to launch and, and expanded several data repositories, including the Human Fertility Database. Uh, Tomasz, you've done a lot of research, as we've just said, on these topics. We just come uh, out of a very interesting um, event that UNFPA and the Bulgarian government organized on demographic resilience where you chaired a session on fertility and family policy. So you are very well placed to tell us what some of the more promising policies are that actually allow women and families to achieve their fertility intentions or anything else you'd like to reflect on, Thomas. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to the panel. I'm, I'm very delighted to be part of this conversation. Uh, let me first start from a little bit more uh, broader perspective. I think we are witnessing very interesting kind of period in the last 10 or 15 years when many governments and many um, highly developed countries are kind of experimenting with different policy approaches. Uh, this is especially seen in countries with, where the governments are really concerned about depopulation, um, about very low fertility and about the pace of population aging. Uh, now, we can discuss later on whether all these concerns are justified, but at least they result in very different types of new policies being rolled out and definitely in the governments uh, investing much more money in families and family policies. Now, not everything which is being done uh, is done properly. So let me, before I get into specific examples, let me first outline a couple of limitations and a couple of, I would say, even traps which many governments are falling into when they try to implement different family policy schemes. So I will try to highlight three of them before I get into these uh, specific examples what governments are doing uh, often right. So one thing is that many of these governments are completely ignoring the diversity of families and the diversity of individual preferences men and women have about when do they, have, when do they want to have children 
and uh, how many kids they want to have and under which circumstances. And uh, really this, this kind of ignorance that, that we are different, uh, that, that people are in very different configurations with respect to their socioeconomic status and family situations means that uh, often governments are kind of targeting relatively narrow groups of people and ignoring some others. Uh, especially, this is especially the case in governments which are uh, trying to provide a lot of monetary incentives uh, for families, but then are completely ignoring uh, many issues around uh, career and family life, around gender inequalities, as mentioned also by Peter, and so on. So this is a, this is a big failure, and this failure is especially concerning in many cases highly educated women who obviously uh, are not so much in need uh, in many countries of, of direct monetary support uh, of things like child allowances, but would really need uh, to have an environment which, which is really fostering uh, a decent work and family uh, combination. Now, the second thing which, which many countries, the second trap which many governments are falling into is that policies are often driven by ideological agenda, um, often by ethno-nationalist considerations. And uh, this obviously uh, is also wrong from the perspective of completely ignoring uh, some minorities, ethnic minorities, uh, sexual minorities, uh, other, 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 other groups, other population groups, migrants, and so on and so forth. But these policies are often also kind of one-sidedly focused on numbers. Uh, the government think that they will get away from, from all the population challenges by increasing the number of people in their countries, or at least stabilizing the number of people in their countries. And I'm sure Stuart will, will get into this topic later on, but uh, this is, there is no way of, of kind of escaping uh, dealing properly with demographic issues and challenging by simply trying to increase numbers of people. That's, that's the most inefficient way. And uh, this, this doesn't really work in the long term to, to address issues linked to population aging, low fertility, and so on and so forth. Uh, this obviously also uh, ignores reproductive rights and, and creates a lot of gender biased expectations. One Japanese minister uh, some time ago called women childbearing machines. So this is, this is also, I mean, this is an extreme illustration of how some of these policies are being enrolled. And we see it increasingly that in countries, uh, especially with more authoritarian governments, such as Russia, Iran, Turkey, but also Poland and Hungary, uh, the governments are kind of one-sidedly focused on trying to launch policies which, which will lead to higher numbers of births, uh, especially for uh, the national ethnic groups. And obviously, maybe the last point, not only these policies are doomed to fail in the long-term perspective, but they are also often violating reproductive rights and freedoms, either in an outright way, as uh, is the case of an almost complete ban of abortion in Poland, or in a more subtle ways, for instance, by curbing or not launching proper sexuality and reproductive health education among young people, or limiting the access to free provision of contraception in some other societies. Now, the third point I want to make before going into specific examples is returning to the issue of money. Obviously, money matters, and we are often dealing also with countries where many substantial number of people, especially families are living in kind of substandard economic conditions when they don't have enough resources to buy uh, or to have decent housing or to provide their kids the things that, that the kids need to, to, to thrive. So, so obviously money is important, but again, uh, assuming that, that you pay your way uh, out of all uh, the issues around family policies and low fertility is a very, very simplistic perspective. And that's not enough. The governments need to think beyond money, need to think about the whole package of policies 
supporting women, men and couples in realizing their preferences and choices. Now, all these limitations have one thing in common. Policymakers are more often than not uh, following their own kind of preconceptions and expectations and judgments about what needs to be done. And sadly, we are still often missing more careful and data-driven policy approaches where the policies would be first of all informed by the data like generation and gender surveys, which try to ask people, women and men and couples about what kind of preconditions they need to have a baby, what kind of things they need to realize their reproductive plans and choices. So that's, that's obviously one gap which needs to be addressed better in most countries in the future. Let me now use the next five minutes or so to, to highlight some of the policy approaches and, and uh, reforms which have been done in the last decade or so. Uh, I will ignore the monetary approaches, uh, which have been many, but let me just uh, say once more that, that especially those which, which try to be universal, which try to provide universal support uh, to families, especially in lower income countries, are very, very important. But that's not enough. And ideally, they should be launched together with other sets of policies, which are often sadly ignored. So jumping the monetary support and getting into the early childcare period, especially provision of early childcare education and providing flexible parental leave schemes, I think are very, very key parts of, of good family policies. And we have seen many initiatives in that respect as well. Uh, let me, for instance, highlight the approaches of Germany, where Germany in the last 15 years more or less adopted a Nordic playbook for family policies. And I think the government has done it really well. So the country which used to be traditionally viewed as a place which really supports the traditional division of labor uh, within families of women staying for three or four years or even longer at home with their kids and fathers continuing their careers uninterrupted has really changed the paradigm. Now the right of parents for good quality childcare is being recognized. And essentially uh, the legal framework is now that the parents have a right for childcare since the age of one. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really a, a big thing. And, and I'm very happy that the Germany has done it. And at the same time, the German government has think of the parents who don't want to go from say zero, zero, uh, zero labor force participation during uh, the maternity leave to 100% participation. So, so German government has started, has launched subsidies for parents who are staying uh, part-time at home with their kids and working part-time. And the government is subsidizing 66% or 67% of the lost income of parents who, who decide to reduce their work hours and work only part-time. So this is very useful. But we also see initiatives from countries which are not as rich as Germany and which don't have so many resources to kind of provide to support childcare provision. And one of these examples we heard last week uh, in Sofia at the UNFPA conference was from Moldova, which tries many smaller scale solutions to support childcare. And I, will, I can name three of them. One is uh, to provide a regulatory framework for the informal child carers. This, this was a very common thing, all, all kinds of nannies and providing childcare services informally to families which hasn't been regulated at all until now. And the government is trying to roll out certification of and some regulation of, of, of this business so that the parents uh, really know that they are hiring someone who is experienced or who, who at least has the knowledge how to, deal, how to deal with kids. The government is also providing vouchers to parents which, which they can exchange for childcare services from different establishments and is subsidizing uh, companies who try to roll out their own company childcare, providing about half uh, of the subsidies to, to, to get started and to provide childcare in the initial year or two. 
Now, let me jump from childcare to emphasizing some parental leave options. Uh, I will give you sh two short highlights, two quick highlights of uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. One example is uh, the country where I am sitting now in, where I come from, Czechia, which gives relatively large amount of money, 300,000 uh, Czech crowns per child, which translated into euros is about 12,000 euros. And this is in a country where the average net monthly salary is something over 1,000 euros. So, so 12,000 euros is a decent amount of money. As a parental leave allowance to which parents are entitled after the birth of each child. So it's not really depending on the previous wage, it's an allowance for everyone. And the parents are flexible in deciding whether they want to draw this allowance within the period of one to four years so they can decide the shorter time and have a higher allowance or a longer period of, of drawing this allowance and have it smaller. And also both parents are very flexible in combining their parental leave this, company, uh, this continuing involvement in labor force participation and uh, in kind of combining or, or choosing whether it's the father or the mother who stays at home with the kid on parental leave and for what period of time. In a similar vein and even uh, in a kind of stronger monetary support, Estonia has increased tremendously its maternity leave and parental leave uh, both period and benefit. So Estonian parents now, first, the mothers can stay at home on maternal leave for 70 to 110 days, who pay 100% of the previous wage. But then after that, the parents still have 435 days of leave, fully paid 100% of their previous wage, which they can consume after the until the age of three of their kid. So this is very generous, very flexible, and uh, also kind of gender equal with uh, some extra days of paternity leave for the fathers, 30 days for the fathers. Now, I don't want to spend too much time uh, going into other policy schemes. I'm sure we will have time to, to get into more discussion of them in, in the next uh, one Thomas, hour. I just have to give you one more minute, okay? So we can- Perfect. So, so let, me, let me think what's missing still in these schemes. I think we are still missing some more bolder and longer term approaches. Uh, we need to think a little bit out of the box about how to deal with, with pressures which parents still face in many countries, how to build more child and family friendly societies. But also we need to think what we can do more for young adults who are not really in the stage of having families yet, but as a precondition of having families people first need to form a couple. They need to have a place where to live with their partners. And in many high income countries, young adults are those who are taking the brunt of unstable labor markets, low wages, and absolutely unaffordable housing situation with, with skyrocketing housing prices. And this is really the group we need, we need to think much more uh, when thinking of family policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tomas. That's uh, super interesting as well. And, and thank you for introducing the element of the politics to the conversation, the, the human rights implications, because I think that just as we saw the obsession with population growth or the population bomb over 50 years ago, we're now seeing the obsession with population decrease, the population bust, and all of the implications that has on policy, as you so aptly described. Um, I think you've also mentioned something which I, I feel is very important and I'm sure Stuart will address shortly in, in terms of the way we frame the problem in at least in this part of the world as a low fertility driven threat to the very existence of society leads to a certain type of policy response. Um, and it is leading in some cases to misaligned public policy responses and environment conducive to an ethno nationalist agenda which you also pointed out and this rollback on women's and reproductive rights, uh, which is why we all need to take this very seriously and as a community see what we can do to uh, change this narrative. 
Um, and thanks also for outlining some of the more promising examples of the way governments are experimenting with different policy approaches um, and, and, and some of the things we need to continue focusing on. I think it's really important and you raised those in Bulgaria as well. Um, the issue of looking at, at couples when they're just trying to form a couple and, and supporting that part of, of life as well as the housing issue. So let me move now to uh, Dr. Stuart Bastian. Stuart Geitel Bastian is Professor of Social Science and Public Policy and Associate Dean of the research um, of research in the School of Humanities and Social Science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His research focuses on the causes and consequences of low fertility, with a particular focus on East and Southeast Asia. Um, Stuart, you've heard a lot about fertility and family policies. Um, you also have done a lot of work on the issue of population aging and population decline. It's often seen as a bad thing, blamed on low fertility, as I just mentioned. So um, the obvious answer that we see around the world is raising fertility, right? Can you, can you explain to us how would you convince policymakers otherwise? Stuart, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Alana. And because um, I, well, I would say that before we start looking for the for the solution, the first thing is we really need to look at what the problem, so-called problem, quote unquote, uh, actually is. And this seems to be very poorly defined, I think, in different parts of the world. And and again, we have to think that the the problem, quote unquote, is going to be very different in different parts of the world that if you're in a part of the world where there is a pay-as-you-go pension system, for example, then if, you know, it stands to reason that all of the things being equal, if there are fewer people paying into a pay-as-you-go system and more people taking out of a pay-as-you-go system, there's a problem, right? There will be a lack of sustainability about that. Similarly, if you've got systems of socialised healthcare and long-term and a very expensive long-term care systems, if we see rapid aging under a business as usual scenario for everything else, then obviously these systems are probably gonna come under some kind of pressure. But then if we're looking in other parts of the world, so in, in middle income countries, where a lot of this anxiety uh, we're, we're starting to see most recently, there is this kind of concern that we're gonna grow old before we get rich. I've never really entirely understand what that means and what, what the fundamental problems underneath that are. It seems quite a vague concept about premature aging, that there is like an optimum pathway to aging. And this is the European way. But then we're always complaining about the way that we've aged as societies as well. So this this, I think, is, is slightly um, uh, challenging. And I, I don't think that the framing of the whole thing really helps us. Now, but if we do look at those kinds of issues, these institutional issues, which population aging, population stagnation, population decline inevitably will bring pressure on, then we need to actually ask ourselves, as Thomas intimated uh, before, okay, so let's have more babies. And what would that do? What would that really do, right? What would that really achieve to fix uh, some of these challenges? And, and I know this is kind of state, I sometimes feel like I'm, I, I get tired of saying this and, and I feel embarrassed to say it, but, but babies don't work, right? Young children in many parts of the world, still young children around the world do work, but most young children in our low fertility settings do not work. They don't pay tax. They're not contributing to pension pots and paying into long term, subsidizing long term care systems. They're just not doing it. And they're not going to be doing it for maybe 15 or even 20 years from now, by which time not only will the labor market be completely different, but many of the things we're worried about, well, it's, they will have gone beyond an inflection point, right? There's, it, it's gonna, it will explode. And so, therefore, net of other things, we also have to ask, well, what will happen to these? children, these extra children which are being born when they grow up. And of course, if you don't change the context in which they grow up and want to live and work, they'll just leave, right? That we would see that we have very low fertility in northeastern China, for example. And uh, those are one of the first places which are kind of pushing uh, policies to support childbearing. But then, of course, if nothing else changes, if there's no decent jobs which are created in Dongbei in northeastern China, then people will just leave. And so it doesn't really solve anything, right? It, it's kind of net, it's a net neutral. 
So the problem to me, I think, is that people are simply looking at demographic problems and looking for demographic solutions, right? So aging, depopulation, this is bad. Now, what can we do? Well, we don't want to increase mortality. Um, migration, ugh, you know, politically, we don't prefer, we prefer not to talk about migration. Uh, so let's just go after low fertility, even though we know it's very difficult to realize change and often kind of slightly ethically challenging. Um, and also, even though they know it's a very inefficient means of responding to these challenges. But I think the reason so why is that the case? Because we know really how to fix these challenges. But like all social systems, they take time and they will require significant effort and political capital. And I sometimes feel in the same way that big energy corporations put the responsibility of fixing climate change on individual behavior rather than like taking responsibility themselves and fixing their own systems. Governments can be kind of outsourcing both the problem and the solution of aging and population stagnation. And as an aside, I think this is something that we have to be on our guard for, is that you know, many other people are apportioning blame the, uh, the vaguely defined demographic component on climate change to poor women in the global south, right? Uh, as Thomas mentioned before, we have to think about nationalism and ethno-nationalism and the idea that bigger is better. But I think, again, that's, this is maybe for another day. This gets very prickly, very quickly. Right? Um, but I think we need to call a spade a spade sometimes and say that there are many policies relating to fertility around the world which do not accord to the ICPD principles which the governments who are bringing those policies in signed up to. I think, is, I think we just have to say that sometimes. Um, so it goes without saying then that institutional reforms are likely to be much more effective means of offsetting some of these concerns about the consequences of low fertility. So if you're worried about the strain on the pension system, fix the pension system, right? Then have more babies, but this will be very unpopular. Why do we really worry about depopulation? What is the, what's the problem of depopulation? Is it... Uh, is it about ethno-nationalism or is it more, more grounded in things like opportunities in, in rural development or the provision of public services to increasingly sparsely populated areas or the dying out of kind of cultural heritage? Well, if that's what we're worried about, then we fix that, right? That's, that's what we address. We address those kind of those issues. I mean, just an hour ago with my friends and colleagues in the Islamic Republic of Iran, we presented a paper in a conference organized by UNFPA, which we showed how redefining the boundary to old age and or increasing labor force participation is a much more effective means of, than much more effective means of offsetting some of these standard measures of aging than increasing fertility would ever be, both in the short term and in the medium term and in the long term. And even beyond this, this person-centered approach should lead to a healthier, happier, and I think a more sustainable future for all. In other words, I would say that there's plenty of other levers to pull. This means thinking multidimensionally. It's recognizing what our friend Wolfgang Lutz calls demographic metabolism. So we are getting older, we may be getting smaller as a population, but we're also getting healthier more highly educated, and therefore we have more potential, more demographic potential to be healthy, active, productive across the life course. So instead of just thinking about how we can have more and more and more people, I think government should be thinking more about how we can make the most of the people that we already have. And that means, uh, and the people who are yet to be born. So that's making sure that people's full potential is realized and that in UNFPA language, that no one is left behind. And I would say that when we look more holistically and we define the problem, we can actually have a much brighter outlook on the future, right? It's not a problem, Demo it's demographic change is not a problem, it's an opportunity. If we have a healthier, more skilled population, can we leverage in this into improvements in productivity? Can we ensure that age is, is, age is better, so health is improved across the life course to enable citizens to age in, in an active and healthy way? Can we improve infrastructure and governance so that workers in the informal sector can increase their trust in governments and find themselves better included in social protection systems, right? In the same way that we can leverage the climate, we can turn climate change into an opportunity, can we leverage these changes to develop the care economy as one which is based on dignity and respect? Can we harness the remarkable changes in digital technology and provide more opportunities for all? So if we go back to the examples that I gave at the start, what if we fix the pension system and improve productivity 
and engage people more actively in decent employment for longer. We've got so many more levers to pull. What if we reform and develop sustainable health systems and improve healthy aging to lessen the burden? Of course, these will have multiplier and positive feedback effects. And on the other hand, of course, if we don't do those things, it will just end up compounding each other. So we have lots of levers to pull beyond fertility. We also have lots of tools to get to this better world where we don't need to have such anxiety. We've got the SDGs, we've got the 2030 agenda, we've got MEPA, the Madrid International Plan of Action for Aging, which will be renewed pretty soon. We've got the principles of the ICPD. You know, we have the principle of sustained, uh, inclusive economic growth. It's all there in the little book. You know, it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's here, right? We've got a clue on how to get there, right? It's not that complicated, but it's gonna be a lot of work. And as Thomas and Peter have discussed before, we've got great examples uh, around the, the low fertility world of these things uh, actually happening. Well, I, I have got Moldova on my script as well. Moldova is like the new Sweden. 10 years ago, we always used to say, oh, look, look to Northern Europe, but now we're looking to Moldova, right? But um, you know, there are plenty of, of positive examples that we can draw on. And, you know, and just to give a final example, I mean, we, there's a, more recently, there's a lot of focus on China, on low fertility in China, and this kind of doom-laden predictions about the future. Um, now, of course, I would actually say that a big part of this is grounded in a, is again, grounded in a kind of a nationalistic dialogue and a schadenfreude, I think, in many parts of the world about the, the so-called demographic problems of China. You know, and what will happen when India overtakes China as the most populous country in the world? Nothing, right? In terms, of, in terms of the economy and society of China. But it will be a psychological shift and we can't write that off, right? We have, to, we have to consider that that is actually a challenge. We can't undermine that. But what all the while all the focus is on low fertility in China and some of the schemes designed to encourage childbearing, like taxing the child free, which some people propose, much less attention is paid to the provisions, other provisions in the current 14th year 14 uh, five year plan, which respond to these demographic shifts in a very comprehensive and holistic way through education, skills development, and social security reform and active aging. But of course, this doesn't rate right headlines. So it's always much easier to boil this down to, to take this very reductionist view of, uh, of fertility. So I think that's really where a big part of the problem that we have comes from. So we, we reduce everything down to the lowest common denominator. So therefore we ignore all of the different opportunities and tools that we have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I think you've really asked the key questions to frame this debate. You know, what is the real problem? What is, is there even a problem? Um, or is it the fear of small numbers as Arjun Apadurai would, would insist? Um, so I think before we start looking at what are the solutions, then we really do need to outline these issues that you've raised. And Nikolai Botev, who's a demographer, but also a former colleague of mine, always says that there is no demographic crisis. There's just an economic social crisis with demographic implications. And, and I think that really uh, is very important in the way we think about conceiving policies. So um, you've also mentioned the ICPD, thank you very much. I mean, for us, of course, in UNFPA, this is key. And, and we, you know, the ICPD um, endorsed by 179 countries, I guess, 27, 28 years ago now in 1994. I mean, this has to be the core of, of the way policies are constructed. And particularly in this region, we really want to bring that ICPD to policy formulation. Uh, so thank you, Stuart. I was actually worried that we may not be able to fill 90 minutes, given that one of our panelists uh, was not able to make it, but I see that we've got a great conversation going. Before I turn to the floor and ask whether any of our audience would like to um, ask a question or make a comment, let me just ask Susanna Kabanagi, who is an independent researcher. As I mentioned in the end, she was the one who actually the brain behind this panel and requested us to do this panel. So I thank her very much. Her um, specialization is in data collection and processing, families and households, fertility, gender roles, differentials, population and development, reproductive health and spatial analysis. So I wanna to turn to you, Susanna, and just ask, you know, this is very off the cuff. Um, I know you weren't planning on participating here, but do you have any reflections on what you've just heard? 
any um, anything relevant for Latin America that you might want to raise, um, you know, a region that neither has the great economic resources nor a strong tradition of implementing family policies. Susanna, do you have any reflections that you'd like to give? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Helena. And uh, I'm sorry, Vanda couldn't be here. Uh, First, I, I would like to acknowledge I'm not the brain behind the session, but uh, I'm a, this is I, I was SP and I was asked with with uh, uh, Jalal, who is here, uh, seeing this. So if he has something to say also, I would like uh, to hear from him. Um, and I, I think uh, Stuart have said something that we have to identify the problem and he in Latin America uh, I was talking to Wanda, and I think uh, we we were saying, let's identify the problem here in Latin America. What is the problem here? Why we don't, the thing was, do we have to include Latin America in this? Because we don't have uh, policies uh, for fertility uh, here in Latin America. We have looked at um, if someone from some countries are here listening, just let us know because we, we don't find. And I think uh, the, 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 the problem there, why we don't have policy, because we do have some problems. Uh, I must say, as Peter was saying, we, we have, uh, like in some parts of Asia, we have countries here with very, very low fertility. And uh, most of them are very small countries with very um, economical and dif different problems. So I think we have the problem we don't talk about. It. Uh, I think the word here in Latin America is like resistance uh, to talk about it and silence. And uh, although I, I agree with Stuart that we have to identify the problem and the, the specific solutions, if you don't talk about it, if you deny it, this is a problem in the long run. Um, here in Latin America is not in everywhere, but we have some places like the Caribbean. Uh, we have places with very, very low fertility and why people are not talking about uh, population policies there, not just fertility, but policies. Uh, in some, some uh, Latin, um, countries in, Latin, in, in the Caribbean, uh, the, the biggest problem is migration, out migration. Uh, so fertility is very low and we have a lot of out migration. They are trying to find some policies to keep people there, but not talking about policies for the same problems Thomas has talked about. Uh, you want to make people have more children, those who are staying in the islands or in the small countries in the Caribbean. And if they have kids, they, these kids are going to out migrate when they get the age for uh, working age and they, they are not getting um, uh, the proper uh, jobs. So uh, this is one problem. I, and I think uh, uh, without the resistance for implementation of family, po po uh, uh, policy, family planning programs in, in the 60s, we now have the problem of talking about uh, population policies. And I, I was reminded, listening to this, and, uh, and Carmen Miro, uh, this is a demographer from Latin America, she wrote a very good piece in the 60s about population policies and why we don't talk about population policies so openly uh, within the frameworks of right, rights. And I think in Latin America, the problem is this, this other little word in the, the title of the session, we don't talk about uh, this framework because we are afraid of the politics. We are afraid of talking about population policies within um, politics that are so um, unstable uh, in the country. And uh, so how, how do we go about it and uh, talking about these um, uh, problems uh, that we see? Um, like, what is what is happening right now? Why fertility is so low in Latin America? They are so low and so um, concentrated at young ages, uh, and not just 15, 19, it's 20, 24, for me it's young. So they are very concentrated up to 25 years of age. And what is happening in some countries? Uh, fertility with a lot of policies for uh, um, 
a decreasing uh, adolescent fertility. Some countries are getting there. Some countries like Uruguay, they have very, very low fertility right now, below 1.4, going even down because uh, adolescent fertility is going down. So the question and the problem we have to identify there is that is, is this just a postponement? Uh, it's, uh, it's a decrease because of postponement postponement as has happened in some places in Europe, or this will be something that uh, Lestag was saying, you postpone and you don't have any more because we're changed. So we need to talk about this here uh, and we need to, um, I think, uh, really identify uh, the different problems. And uh, and I, I was, um, uh, I would like to bring to the conversation, like Stuart have said about aging. We are worried about aging and we know that uh, uh, doing a fertility, increased fertility may be not the solution, but uh, maybe uh, is the solution if we give um, the proper rights to women who are more educated, as Toma was saying, and uh, because they are the people not having the kids they would like to have. So if we're talking about the frameworks of right, if we do uh, talk about them, maybe we can implement some policies, not just some, some ways to get fertility up, but uh, ways that people can realize the fertility they want to have. So then we would be in this dream uh, TFR of uh, close by two, uh, as we we were talking like so uh, so many years ago, but we I think we should not follow what the social media is doing. We are we couldn't we cannot do a cancellation scientific cancellation uh, about talking these problems in Latin America and talk about them and find the right solutions. I did find the 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 right problem. So this is one thing that I think we have here. And just a thing about an example from Brazil, like we have one policy here that people would say that is a pronatalist policy, that's the Bolsa Familia, but it didn't work. Um, and why it didn't work? My answer for that, and I have thought about that in the past and write something about it, is, is what Thomas said. Um, the problem is that, um, is pronatalist, but the, 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 the amount of money is very small and is directed to the poor people. And, uh, but uh, poor people are having much more kids than the more educated already. So it didn't work uh, as a pronatalist uh, uh, approach. And even uh, if it worked, we would have a lot of uh, uh, criticism about it because you would be increasing fertility from the poor who are the ones who have a met need who have a lot of unintended fertility uh, so wouldn't be the solution to give more money to them to have kids if they are having so many problems struggling to survive so um, it didn't work as a policy and I, I bet uh, any other policy would work uh, for increasing fertility in Latin America and we, we would get a lot of resistance. So I, I think the word here is like, let's talk about it without any um, uh, censorship uh, and find the right solutions. Because in that, in that regard, I would like to, it's not disagreeing with the steward, but in the long run, we might have problems. So we have to talk about it and uh, to see what are going to be uh, the possible scenarios we have along the way within the frameworks of rights and within um, reproductive rights of ICPD agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. I think th those are excellent reflections and thank you for doing that off the cuff. Um, and also for acknowledging others involved in the session. Um, I wanna thank them and also if they would like to add anything, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. I think you know the one of the major issues you raise is the need to have this conversation openly. There has definitely been less um, population became a bad word in a sense, right? And and we we need to 
have these conversations because politics and population are so closely linked and they impact on people's lives in such a big way. Um, interestingly, when we sent out our invitation for the Demographic Resilience High Level Conference in Bulgaria last week, we got a lot of interest from Latin America. And we had participants from Cuba, Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Costa Rica. Um, and so clearly these issues are of really big concern to many of the countries in Latin America as well. And I would love to see us continue this conversation. Um, just a question to you, and, and, and I'm sure we can't get to this, but I'm interested in your, um, I, I didn't actually realize that the Bolsa Familia program was also meant to be a pronatalist program. And it reminds me of the question of the metrics. I mean, what are governments actually measuring when they are implementing policy? So if it's to boot, if, if they're measuring success in terms of fertility rates, clearly it, it's not working. But if they're measuring success in terms of child survival or education of children, or even uh, reducing the gap between fertility aspirations and actual fertility rates, then perhaps some of these policies are working. Um, I think metrics are important and we need to have that conversation as well, but thanks for raising that issue. Now we are, we have how many minutes left? Let me see, we have 29 minutes left. So before moving to a second question from our panelists, I see a couple of questions here. Rachel Gould, Mohammed Jalal Abbasi. So um, Rachel, please, if I can ask you to limit the questions to about two minutes max, so that we can turn back to our panelists and have them answer. Thank you so much. Rachel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for this really interesting panel. Um, I'm curious, I, I think Thomas and, and Stuart, you both raised some, some really interesting things to think about in terms of when we think about what the causes are of, of people deciding not to have children. Um, I'm doing my research in Israel, and we don't really have that problem. Everyone's thinking about having kids and having kids and talking about it. Um, but I think understanding sort of what those underlying background um, issues are that are preventing people from, from deciding to have kids. And I'm wondering where we think that the issue of climate change and climate anxiety and depression fits in here. Cause I know, you know it's, it's becoming more salient in the American news um, of people talking about and making the decisions and more things are being written about. It's emerging a little bit in Israel in a sort of some online discourses, but in my research so far, um, when I asked point blank what people felt, they are concerned about climate change, but that does not seem to have any effect on their desired or idealized family size. And it's certainly not slowing things down. And Israel is, is definitely poised to be in a place where climate change is a factor for us. Um, so I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, is it starting, is it starting to creep into those, that list of reasons, Thomas, like you were suggesting about you know, being able to afford a house and, and stability in, in, a, in a job situation, in a career, um, and, and where that all sort of fits within the research that we're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That's a great question. And anyone else have questions? Mohammed, do you have a question still? I don't see your hand yes. raised anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Alana and Susanna for moderating and organizing this uh, session. And it's really great to see so many friends and colleagues who have, uh, I mean, concern about a uh, future of uh, population and population policies. Paul Demeni in one of his uh, papers uh, uh, mentioned that demographers are good at collecting and analyzing data and somehow and projecting, but they are weak in policy design and population policy design. And that's one of the most challenges that we are facing. That's one. Secondly, uh, what I see uh, is that uh, developing countries, I mean, Latin America, Asia, uh, some countries that were considered as uh, developing countries are now facing with the issue of low fertility, below replacement fertility, very low fertility. And that's, uh, I mean, it's a recent phenomenon, unlike European countries that have been experiencing this issue for uh, so many decades. European countries are, have been facing uh, and designing policies and have had concern about depopulation, immigration, and other policies. And now these countries are becoming concerned about future of population, future of their population, depopulation, and other issues that Europe is faced now. 
Um, and this is uh, uh, given the fact that uh, there is no established uh, socioeconomic system in place in these countries. Uh, women's education uh, has been advanced, but as Peter said, there is no gender equity sort of institutions uh, in place. Uh, and thus, uh, they are worried uh, about uh, future of population and they don't know what to do. That's uh, what I'm seeing and experiencing in Iran and other uh, countries. The solution, the easy solution that they come up is to copy European lessons and paste to their context. And that's really a challenge because they have, as I said, no institution place. They're culturally different. The issue is new. And we don't, we are lacking a population policy experts. Now politicians have a step in and they uh, find and want the easy and uh, quick solutions and they ratify laws, pronatalist laws that may not be effective. So they look at, for example, um, maternity leave, but uh, what we see here in Iran is only 15% of women are at, at the working place. So what about the rest of the population who are educated and they desire lower fertility? How can we raise fertility under these circumstances? So what I'm seeing, uh, saying is that I think uh, we should um, uh, decompose the problem from um, West to East and Asia and Latin America, look at their context and also try to uh, design policies which are more culturally and institutionally different uh, from uh, experiences in Europe. I, I mean, what I'm, what I'm, I'm not saying that we should not uh, uh, learn experiences from Europe, but what I see is that, as uh, Stuart was saying, the issue, the problem is different and we have to start defining and designing policies which are appropriate. And one of the solutions is to train us. I mean, we have to train ourselves. We have to get more training. We have to put energy in younger generation of demographers to be multidisciplinary oriented, to know what is policy, how to do, how to design policies, how to prepare demographic, uh, what they call it, data and methodology to respond to policies. We should teach evaluation. Uh, I mean, what they call it for policies to be able to design and then evaluate these policies. Thank you, sorry. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Very good questions also. Um, I see a comment from the floor, excellent panel from Daniel Goodkind. Uh, to all of you then, when I get back to you, will fertility rates be lower than they are now in low fertility societies? So you may wanna to touch on that, um, especially Peter. Um, okay. Zolt, Zolt, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but I've read many of your articles, which are always excellent. So <laughs> please. Over Thank to you, Arana. Uh, only two short uh, intervention, one to Stuart and one to supporting Muhammad's uh, idea and, and, uh, and view. Stuart to say, yes, all problems are social problems. There is no demographic problem, uh, if, if you like that, because migration is also not a demographic problem as such. So in that regard, Yes, fertility problem is a social, can be a social problem from different point of view. It can be from human rights point of view, from pronatalist, from, from population decline point of view, but you are right that we should understand uh, 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 developments and the uh, optional political values that are behind that kind of uh, problem uh, uh, sensitivity. So that's only a short intervention that, that I do not see that, uh, that there is no problem. It, of course, we can understand from a different point of view. The second, what I also very shortly, I, I would like to support Mohamed's uh, uh, idea that yes, uh, we have several institutions uh, and several measurements, but we cannot shopping with different measurements and putting into different places. And that means that the context, the social context, in this institutional development and background, it's a context for any policy issues. So in uh, and, and any policy measurement in one country, it can be uh, how to say effective in another, not effective because of the different policy. Uh, uh, context. And the third point that uh, also I think uh, uh, strengthening Peter's argument that the major issue is the 
uh, the female male uh, relationship and uh, if we are uh, experiencing the expansion of education in uh, especially among females and we should be acknowledged the double earner family will be the future that means that reconciliation of family and job that will be all, overall the key issue um, in order to let's see as Susanna told me, realization of the wished or, or intended children, because that is the kind of human rights issue that, yes, uh, people would like to have uh, uh, children, and whether the policy helps or support them in order to realize their aims, their life goals, it drive goals. It cannot be only a, 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 a elimination of poverty, but uh, giving the chance to realize their, how to say, major life aims. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, so the, the clock is ticking and we don't have much time left. So I think I'll turn back to our three panelists. And of course, Susanna, if you have anything else to add, please feel free to do so. I would give you each around three minutes to respond to uh, the questions that were raised, but also other issues that you would like to make sure that the audience hears. So um, maybe Peter, you can also answer the question, will fertility rates be lower than they are now in low fertility societies? Climate anxiety playing a role. Thomas, I think you can speak to that. And the role of demographers in policy design. Stuart, I think you can really speak to that one. So please, over to you, Peter, starting with you. Yeah, well, uh, will fertility go lower? Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, it could be that uh, we're seeing uh, a delay of uh, fertility, again, another burst, but uh, that almost certainly will push fertility lower, and it has throughout time. Uh, cohort fertility has been falling constantly through a very long period of time uh, and uh, doesn't seem to be levelling up uh, as yet. So, yes, I think uh, it's quite likely that fertility will fall. You know, we, I was so sure about, uh, as I said, this dichotomy between, you know, I was one of the people promoting that notion, uh, the dichotomy between the Nordic countries and the English-speaking countries on one hand, Southern Europe on the other hand, and big theoretical framework around it. But uh, now, wow, what's happening? You know, <laughs> that English-speaking countries, Nordic countries rocketing downwards, uh, uh, something has changed. Um, and uh, one interesting trend, I think, is that of the low fertility now is if uh, it's very much the case in the US that the fertility has dropped very heavily for the minorities, for, for the Blacks and the Hispanics in the United States. Uh, it's true also in Australia that the, that the lower educated group fertility has dropped a lot. Uh, and in Australia, and, and we have to be careful about policies, when Thomas talks about uh, diversity of the population, he's right. But in Australia, the policy agenda is directed enormously towards the upper end. Because it's, it, it is around work, uh, pretty help you if you're not working. You know, if you're unemployed, you get almost nothing. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's a huge uh, social inequity now between, uh, in terms of family payments or family support policies. So I think that's another issue that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, um, yeah. I did mention also for, the, for uh, the, on the climate change issue, 15 to 24 year olds don't see the future in a very rosy way. And that's certainly the case with climate change. And uh, I used to speak to my children back in the 1980s and my you know, family policies, people said, were based on what my children said. Now it's what my granddaughter says in the 15 to 20, 40, 24 age group. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thomas, over to you. Thank you. So there are so many issues. Uh, it's difficult to choose uh, where to start or to reflect, but let me start with the climate. I think it's it's one of the most exciting things where we don't have a straightforward answer. On the one hand, I'm a bit skeptical. I think many people who say that they aim to be childless. I mean, climate is really important in the conversations, especially among younger generations. That's clear, no question about that. But often when I see people saying that they plan to be childless, they don't want to burden this planet with, with another child, 
I feel they may be also just talking about all other things, economic insecurities, and about the ways how increasingly having kids is seen as a pressure, as a, as a kind of heavy duty, no fun about having kids. When I talk with my Korean friends and colleagues, uh, I mentioned to my Korean born colleague in the office that, that people are just not perceiving having kids as anything positive. You get less sex, uh, less income, uh, less free time. So, so, so this perception that this is just something really very non-fun activities. It's very strongly entrenched in many super low fertility countries. And she looked at me and she said, well, Thomas, is there any fun about having a kid? Is, 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 this, <laughs> is this something you <laughs> people can have fun with? So, so she was completely perplexed by this notion that, that uh, you know, having a kid can be meaningful for the parents, can be a source of joy and, and inspiration. Um, now, let me reflect one more thing. I think we, we get really into the heart of, of uh, the issues, what the policies are for in, in some of the conversations. And Alana, you mentioned the metrics. How do we gauge and assess policies? I think that's very important. Some of us still are thinking of policies as being measured by how much they increase fertility rates or can increase fertility rates. This is tricky. This is difficult. I think the governments never throw enough money on the problem and enough effort to really meaningfully increase fertility rates in a long-term sustained way. Rather, this often generates short-term waves of baby booms and baby busts, all these tempo effects we know about. I think the question should be really turned the other way around. How do we build policies to allow people to realize their preferences? Not only the positive ones, but also how not to allow them not to make the kids they don't want to have, allow them not to have unplanned, unwanted pregnancies and births. That's that's very important part of that. And again, referring to the uh, ICPD framework of reproductive rights. And if, if we are able, if the societies are able to design their own ways in their culture and also recognize that one size doesn't fit all, uh, every society, I mean, Every society is different and Jalal is perfectly right. And Salt was commenting on that as well. We need different policies for different societies, but I think some basic principles are the same. It's not only about money. It's not only about one size fits all expectations that parents will behave in a certain way. Thank you, Tomas. Very ex excellent remarks as always. All right. Lastly, I'm going to go to Stuart again and, you know, building on your idea, Thomas, that we really need to build policies that allow people to realize their preferences, whether it's for more children, less children or no children. Um, Stuart, do you think we should just forget about fertility altogether? And related, yeah, that, to, that, related to that is the, the other question that we received on the role of demographers in policy design. How can demographers and social scientists help to change this conversation with government policymakers? How can we shift the narrative? Yeah, that's right. That's something I, I was worried that I, I, and I'm trying to think of another expression than to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it doesn't, like, I don't mean to be funny, but I, I don't want to come across that that's what I'm trying to do. We shouldn't, of course, forget about fertility. Fertility is still crucially important, but it is just one component of these, of these changes. And I think that the difference is about how we can think about and as we talked again already about it, the, let's, you know, ICPD, let's not go down the national target route. OK, let's just let's tick that one off. And then we say, let's look at it at the micro level. Let's look at it as Thomas talks about in terms of aspirations and kind of meeting aspirations and, and seeing that gap, whether it's in high fertility or low fertility settings, seeing that that big gap between aspirations and reality as not being as actually being some kind of downstream consequence of other challenges or the problems or the institutional malfunctions in society and then trying to kind of tackle those at root and i think if we did tackle those at root fertility would probably change but that's not the reason to do it right you do it because it's recognized and precisely these challenges that all of us uh, have, have talked about um today i think just to uh, be, uh, with what Daniel and Jalal both uh, talked about uh, is this kind of east and west and different parts of the world. Um, um, I think that um, 
part of the problem with that is that again we're in our mindset we we think of kind of pop you know a fertility transition well europe has gone through the fertility transition and as as peter has mentioned you know i don't know whether we have all gone through the fertility transition we don't know we, it's not finished the story is not finished so therefore applying our unfinished story on middle income countries and assuming that they're all going to do the same and then to apply policies from a hundred years ago to middle income countries is not going to work, right? So we have to take a more, a more systematic approach. But then I mean, that's why I got to do a pitch for a comparative uh, view to this, right? So comparative surveys, whether it's like GGS generation and gender survey, whether it's uh, the aging surveys that we have, they really help to show us the differences between different places. And then um, the last thing, is um, on kind of policy design and what we have to do. I, I think that we just, it goes without saying that we have to be more engaged with, we have to be at the table when it comes to policy and we have to be a little bit more brave. My heart starts going when I start talking about ethnocentralism, uh, ethno-nationalism, right? And rights, right? Because it's much safer for me to put up a graph of TFR or of some dependency ratio and then forget about it, right? I'll leave that to other people. But we can't, we can't outsource this. Right. We have to take responsibility for this, but also it's to do with our language. Like we, we've got to stop saying low fertility is a problem and that aging is a problem and depopulation is a problem. And that, you know, the, the, the replacement rate and on all of our graphs have 2.1 as a line, as this perfect line that we should aspire to. Right. We have to we have to go beyond that. I think that and you know we have to talk to each other more within the discipline and make sure that fertility knows what aging is worried about and that aging knows what health is worried about and that migration is not left out and that the forecasters don't just make forecasts and then dump it out there without any context and say oh this is what the future is going to be you know and then that gets jumped upon and then we, we, it can you know it, it can become a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. So I, I think that we, you know, there are, yes, of course, we've got to be at the table more. We've got to be in the policy table. But I think that we can also be a little bit more careful and just take a minute to explain concepts and measures that we use in a, in a more effective way to actually improve that uh, dialogue, which goes back to exactly what Jalal said earlier on. Thank you, Stuart. Couldn't agree more. So we now have eight minutes um till the end of this session so before i turn to susanna do you have any final reflections okay susanna can i give you two minutes and then yeah 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 i would would like just to say about the the fertility if it is going even down uh and i think uh in latin america what we have seen is that fertility went down so fast and in a way so different and that we have now uh, this consequence of have aging coming so fast on our he heads that, and we don't have the proper uh, policies in place to deal with that. So we do have to think about long-term um, consequences of, of this. And what's going to happen with fertility, as Peter, I don't know, but I guess it still is going to go down because of what I have said before, because of uh, um, adolescent fertility going down. Uh, that is good, but uh, how long that's going uh, to be here, we don't know. But as demographers, we should look not just at the timing, but also at the percentage is what is happening. And Rosero Bisbe was the first one to say people are retreating from fertility. And if we have a lot of people having zero and having one, there is no way we are going to get uh, uh, a fertility that, that is a round replacement or even, even uh, we don't have to have replacement for so long, but what's in the long run is going to happen. We don't know, but for sure fertility is going to go down and it is going down fast. And what are the consequences for that uh, in the long run? Uh, and we have seen the past. So we can look at that and, and see if really uh, how we, we have to be on the table talking about those and also having uh, open conversations and not, and I, I, not, I do not have problem with the word problem. We have to, it's not a population problem, it's a social problem, but I do like the word problem because if we identify the problem, then we can look for the solution. Great, thank you, Susanna. 
All right, I'm looking around to see if anyone has any final, final thoughts. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I'll just um, perhaps very quickly give a word on UNFPA's perspective, because I think um, I'm very pleased to be invited on behalf of UNFPA to moderate this session. As I mentioned, the issues of low fertility uh, population decrease are becoming, I would say, increasingly prominent on our own agenda because of the implications that it has uh, for reproductive rights, human rights, and building inclusive societies. We, as I mentioned, just had this uh, very important conference in Bulgaria with the Bulgarian government on, on a concept of called what we call demographic resilience, which I'm going to plug now because I think for us, language is very important. And many of you have mentioned it, but the, the notion that population decline, that aging is a crisis, or the notion that it's an existential threat or a national security threat, as we see in some of the countries of our region, we have uh, demographic security programs. This notion really needs to be shifted. And I, I think that all of us here as an international community addressing population and development have a responsibility um, to get involved in that because of the, the very important consequences that it can have on human lives and human well being. From my own research, um, I'm an anthropologist by training, I've concluded actually that imagination and ideology rather than data are central to the creation and construction of the population crisis in Eastern Europe. Um, so we are working hard uh, to really move away from these narrow and ultimately futile policies on boosting fertility rates towards a more comprehensive approach that holistically addresses the underlying reasons why so many people cannot realize their fertility intentions, which all of you spoke about, or why they feel compelled to leave their countries to look for better opportunities elsewhere, which Susanna, you spoke to. And, and we know that a lot of the um, population decline in many of the countries, at least in our region, is, is fueled by out-migration and not by low fertility. So um, we have created something called the SOFIA Alliance, a community of action, uh, policy and practice that is going to hopefully contribute to achieving what we're calling the decade of demographic resilience. That's for this region only, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. But we would be very pleased and honored to have your active role in contributing to the SOFIA Alliance and really bringing policy and practice together defining what is the problem and, and finding solutions to uh, real problems rather than ideological problems. Let me, I'm just looking one last time, if, if any of you would like another 30 seconds to say anything before we conclude. Any of our panelists? No, everyone is happy? All maybe, right. maybe I can, I can uh, do, yeah. I don't know, 30 seconds, but one I minute. think how low fertility can go. I think we will see as Susanna also mentioned, many, many countries falling much farther than they have so far in their fertility rates. And one reason for that is that I believe this is like a universal thing. Almost every country post-transitional in the late stage of the transition goes through this shift to ever later timing of childbearing because all the cultural and social and economic forces are now aligned in the way that people are kind of incentivized and planning to have kids ever later in life. So this delayed childbearing and how to help couples realizing it, including all the infertility issues, I think will be a big thing on our agenda in the next decades in many countries. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Thomas. Yes, as you mentioned before, the story is unfinished. We, we shall see, but as I believe that as long as we put people at the center of our policies, we, we can't go wrong. So once again, thank you to the outstanding panelists, uh, Peter McDonald, Stuart Bastian, Thomas Sobotka, Susanna Kavanagi. It's been a great conversation. I hope that we can continue this conversation, uh, both within the IPC, but beyond, and um, clearly extremely relevant for the globe. So thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers of this panel. It's been great to be together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alana, for a so great moderation. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.